wrap up this three-part uh, series on voices from the incarnation. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the, at the voices of the angels, how they just showed up in an intense way surrounding the birth of Jesus. And then last week, we looked at the voice, voices of the women, how prominent the women were in the birth of Jesus, how prominent the women are because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today we want to take a look at the men, the men. We're going to uh, read, I clearly have been distracted during this season. I don't like to be, um, but I've been studying this and I told Linda, put Luke 1, 18 to 25 on the bulletin even though I was looking at Matthew 1, 18 to 25. And, that's, and that is strictly on me. It just shows you how I, was, I knew where I was going, but I wasn't telling others where I was going, all right? It's Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Make no mistake, Luke 1, 18 to 25 is fantastic. Read it. But we're looking at the voices of the men this morning, Matthew 1, 18 to 25. I hope you'll find that in your Bibles. When you find it, stand with me so we can read, you can follow me as I read. If you don't have your Bible, don't have access, we've got the text on the screen for you for that very purpose. Listen to this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Jesus. Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. What have we just read together, folks? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help all of us today to learn from the men, both the good and the bad we're going to learn from the men today but also to recognize that we too, if we're saved by grace through faith, we too are a voice, should be a voice for the incarnation. Thank you, please be seated. Well, we just read a passage and, and if I ask in the light of that passage, what did Joseph say? You're gonna answer to me, well, Joseph didn't say a thing. We don't have a word from Joseph here. In fact, it's, it's striking. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, reading through the gospel accounts. We don't have a word from Joseph the carpenter who was assigned uh, the role of father of Jesus. Not a biological father, to be sure. Not a word. Does this mean that he does not add his voice to the incarnation? No. What we see in Joseph, and this is what I want to point out here. When you look down at this passage and the angel calls his name in verse 20, Son of David, Joseph, son of David. You, Joseph was in the royal line, a son of David. And he's told by the angel, the angel's doing a lot of talking here. We looked at this passage three weeks ago in terms of what the angel was saying to him. As he's dreaming, told, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her has been placed there by the Holy Spirit. And he goes on and tells him what's going to happen. She's going to have a son. We don't have to wonder at that point what the sex of the child is going to be. You're going to call him Jesus. Don't have to wonder at all what we're going to call him. Are we going to carry on the name, the family name? 
None of that was up for grabs. But I'm struck. The angel tells him the prophecy that's being fulfilled in his betrothed. Verse 24 grips me, though. Because I read this and I ask myself, and I want you to ask yourself, would I have been this compliant? Would I have been this obedient when Joseph woke from sleep? He did not say something. He did something. He obeyed. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He'd been tossing and turning. Fighting the temptation to despise this young woman whom he had set his heart upon marrying. Wondering, what do I do? If I follow the tradition of the law, I will be the one to consent to her being stoned to death. In fact, when you read these accounts externally of the scriptures, you discover that he may have been the one called upon to throw the first stone because, because the fact of her being pregnant outside of their union shamed him first. And as he wrestles with this, he comes to the conclusion, I can't do it. I can't do this to this young maiden. I will divorce her quietly. Understand, folks, you read this text, He'd already made up his mind. He was going to take an honorable way out of this union in the way that would least harm her. And as he dreams, he receives a communication from the announcing angel. Don't be afraid to do this, Joseph. Don't be afraid to marry her. What's happening to her is not a result of her sin, but a result of God's grace. She's going to have a son, Joseph. A son. Every good Jew who was a man wanted a son. The son would ensure the carrying on of the family name. The son, in Jewish context, had a sense of the blessing of God upon it. It's not to say for us, if we don't have sons that were not blessed by God, that's just the Jewish mentality. And here's what you're going to call him Jesus. In Greek, Jesus. The Hebrew equivalent, Yahashua. His name derived from Joshua. God is my salvation. Call him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. And there was Joseph faced. And I love, though he does not speak, what he does echoes into eternity. He did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He was a doer of the word and not only a hearer. He was a doer of the word and not a doubter of the circumstances. Joseph should be highly commended to us. And men, every man here should long to be known by his wife, by his children, his grandchildren, his community, his church, that he is a doer of the word, not a doubter of the word. And then we shift to another a group, the, the Magi, these Eastern uh, stargazers, these astronomers. They, they studied the stars, the charts, the movements. They read historical texts. These were not Jews, but they were familiar <laughs> with the Old Testament prophecies. These were serious students. Now, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, and they were inquiring. 
Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. That's gripping. I want, I want to challenge you. What did they have to go by? They had the prophecies of the Old Testament that were not native to them. They, they studied, and poured over holy documents, various documents, and they found in the Old Testament scriptures compelling witness that there was an event coming and the star shone so brightly they in all of their study and wisdom concluded this is the sign that's going to lead us to the king that will be born and we will not we will not go to evaluate him we will not go to give our wisdom to him we will go and we will worship him this was very inconvenient they journeyed from afar. They would travel and camp, travel and camp, travel and camp. And it was something of an entourage to, to go. These men, these men were prominent men. They would have carried with them an entourage. And they determined beforehand, I love this, in a, in a season when I saw a, a, a meme on Facebook recently. It said it's December the 23rd, 22nd, two days before men begin to shop for Christmas. These men made plans. They didn't say, let's go find him, and then, then if we think it's fitting, we'll, we'll select some gifts to give to him if we think that's right. They carried with them from their country gold befitting a king, frankincense befitting the anointing of a king, myrrh befitting burial. These men were wise beyond their years. And they went, I emphasize again, to worship him. To adore him. I wonder sometimes in our, in our culture if people don't get so caught up in Christmas that they miss Christ. They don't get so, I, I read something in it that I'll, I'll develop this a little more in the future, but it's shocking to me that a, that a very large Southern Baptist church pastored by the current president of the Southern Baptist Convention has a tradition of taking off the last Sunday of the year because their members are so tired. And they encourage the folks to gather in their home and worship in their home in some way, shape, or form. But they don't, they don't come to gather on the Lord's Day, on, on this Sunday, because they're so tired. And I say, thank God the wise men didn't think that way. Thank God the Christians being persecuted right now in the, in the early rain covenant church in China don't think that way. Their pastor and a hundred members of their church have been arrested and imprisoned and he saw it coming so he made plans and he wrote out materials that are being disseminated now. And one of the things he said we must commit ourselves to is that we will worship together, we will gather together when the, when the, when the government allows us and when the government does not allow us by persecution, we will gather together. And their, one of their other pastors is meeting with that congregation earlier today on their Lord's Day until the government comes and arrests them too. We need in the West, in Oklahoma, in this church, a revival of a passion for the worship of Jesus. And the Magi are an example. They did not worship out of convenience. They didn't worship uh, as long as there wasn't something else that was coming along that they needed to attend to. I would say they made worship a priority. We're about to study that in 1 Corinthians 14 when we get going back in the saddle that next Sunday. Making worship a priority. See, not every voice of the incarnation is a good voice. Look at what Herod said as we continue that passage in Matthew 2, verses 3 through 8. I want you to see this. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem. Where is he who's born king of the Jews? You understand why he was troubled? 
Someone's been born a king. You think there's a king been born? I'm the king. If a king's been born, that means my days are numbered. My prominence, my priority, my privilege, my power is jeopardized. And assembling all the chief priests. But all Jerusalem was troubled with him. Why would that be? They knew what Herod was capable of. And by the way, he doesn't disappoint if you follow through the narrative. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he suddenly has this religious urge about him. He inquired of them where the Christ, the Christos in Greek, the, the Messias in Hebrew, where he was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. You see, the decree of Caesar Augustus seemed to be just a, a political strong-arm tactic to require that everyone go back to the city of their, of their origin, the city of their family, to be taxed. What's beginning to be clear, though, is that, that God used the decree of Caesar Augustus to be sure that Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem where Christ was to be born. From you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod some of, some of the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. When, when did you first see this thing? And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and, and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I too may come and worship him. Some of the most blasphemous words spoken in this whole incarnation narrative. Herod had no desire to worship. That was not his intention. Sounds good, doesn't it? We, we do a lot of religious talk. Oh, I just want to, I just love it, I love it. One of the criticisms that God speaks through Isaiah is, you worship me with your mouth, but your heart is not there. I say again, when an admired Southern Baptist congregation, one of the largest in the convention, can, can in its mindset justify taking off a Sunday, I thank God Jesus didn't take off on Good Friday. I thank God he hadn't taken off since he re-entered heaven. <laughs> he ever lives praying for you and me. Herod, a blasphemer. Because you know what he wanted to do. You've read the narrative. You've read on through. When he ascertained that this thing had been going on about two years, then he sent out his forces to lay hold of and slaughter every male child who'd been born who was two years old or younger. It's a horrible it's an awful voice from the Incarnation, and yet it is a response to the Incarnation. Make no mistake about it, folks. You know people, I know people, you have friends, neighbors, loved ones, relatives, who may, may mouth worship, but who by their actions despise the Christ. They live with a Psalm 2 attitude. We will not have this one rule over us. And it's coming in this country increasingly, increasingly. As we pray for the church in China undergoing intense persecution, again, we need to pray for ourselves that God will get us ready. It's coming. Well, what about the shepherds? A more noble voice, certainly. We read this recently about the, about the angels, but in Luke 2, 8 to 21, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, that, this announcing angel, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, for they were filled with great fear. When he show up to announce God's message, Shekinah comes with it, glory comes with it. And the angel said to them, Fear not, or stop being afraid. For behold, I'm bringing you good news of great joy, that when you tell it, should be told to all kinds of people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, that's Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now notice, 
Call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sin. Born king of the Jews. Savior. He is Christos, the anointed one. The Kurios, the owner. The master. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And we told you, we talked about this. Suddenly these angels burst over heaven. They, they can't hold back. We've already looked at that. We won't develop that. Singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now, look at this though. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, what they did not say was, man, I've never seen anything like that. That scared the life out of me. What about you? Whew. That's not what they said. Said to one another, let us go. The gospel moved them. Let us go over to Bethlehem and, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. I love that they did not they were not content to live off someone else's gospel message. They were not content to live off what someone else had experienced. They themselves wanted to taste and see the Lord is good. This is not a lack of faith here, folks. This is movement because of faith. And I told you these words, and they went with haste, can literally be translated, and they jumped the fences. Here are the shepherds. Here's Jerusalem. Here are fenced pastures that they would have to zigzag around. The scripture says they jumped the fences. They drew the shortest distance between two points as a straight line, and they took it. They didn't hesitate, and they found Mary, who'd been told by the angels. They found Joseph, who'd been told by the angels, and the baby lying in a manger. Notice this, though. These men are not just disciples. They're disciple makers. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. They didn't say, wow, this is wonderful. Let's just, let's just hang with Joseph and Mary. And... No. They come face to face with the King of the Jews, Jesus, the Savior of sinners, the Christ, the Lord, to whom they owed their allegiance and their lives. And how do I know they told it to others? Look at verse 18. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. I've pon I pondered that from time to time. Do I communicate the gospel to people in such a way that it causes them to ponder the marvel of it? Do I speak it as just a, a series of historical facts? Or do I speak it as a, as a reality that's transformational, that's transformed my life, transformed the lives of all who receive it? How do you communicate the gospel? Do we speak it with passion? Do we speak it with a sense of urgency? Do we speak it with a sense of wonder? My friend R.F. Gates used to say to me, Bill, I don't want to wake up. I want to die in my sleep. I don't want to wake up to a morning where I've lost the wonder of Jesus. And I wonder, have you lost the wonder? The shepherds were moved by this. Mary's taking all this in. Verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God. Here's what the picture I get. When they were in Bethlehem, and they saw what the Lord had done, and they were convinced this was the Savior. They went across Bethlehem, telling the good news. And the time came when they had to return to their, their shepherding responsibilities. And they went praising God. This provoked not only a witness in them, not only a discipleship attitude in them, it provoked a sense of worship in them. And I want you to mark that down. Every person we've encountered in this voice of the incarnation worships, except Herod, and he says he wants to, and he's the liar. Glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And then it was time to take Jesus 
to be circumcised. And so we look at what Simeon, we're going to close with this, what Simeon said. And this is precious. They take him to be circumcised, as is written in the law, after eight days. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is in the law, what they can afford. A pair of turtle doves, two young pigeons, that that's for the particularly poor. Now there was a man in Jerusalem, verse 25, whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. I would, I would, dear God, I, man, can you, can you think of a better way to be described? Righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Why was this man living? And the Holy Spirit was upon him. He's an older man. He's found where he should be found, where a man and his family should be found, at the temple, worshiping. The Holy Spirit's upon him. He's, he's being moved and led and instructed by the Holy Spirit. And it had been revealed to him, just as, just as Mary had a revelation, just as Joseph had a revelation, just as the Magi had a revelation, just as the shepherds had a revelation. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. By the way, if you've been saved by grace through faith, you've had a revelation. You've been shown your sins, deserving of hell, and shown a Savior who came and lived and died and rose again that you could be saved. Read Pilgrim's Progress when Hopeful tells his testimony to Christian. Christian says, that was a revelation to your soul indeed. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when, he, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, now get this picture here. He runs up to them and takes him in. He says, can I hold him? Can I hold him? Can I hold him? And blesses God and says, and Mary's words we read last week are the Magnificat. This is called the Nunc Dimittis. Now, Lord, you are letting your servant, nunc meaning now, Demetrius, depart. Now, Lord, you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Look at what this man understands. He understands something that the early church in Acts 15 is still struggling with. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Joseph and Mary are standing here. This man, as a stranger, has walked up. Basically, I don't think he coerced it, but he, I think in a pleading way he convinced her to place this little baby in his arms. And he begins to praise God and bless God. And his father and mother, Joseph and Mary, are marveling at what was said about him. There's a whole lot of marveling going on with Joseph and Mary around the incarnation. I think you'll agree if you've read the, the narratives. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother. So he blesses them. Oh, God, bless these parents of this child. Then he says to Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. People who are in prominent places will be taken down. When you put this in the other context, this sounds like insurrection. No. He's appointed this Savior whose name is Jesus, this King of the Jews, this Christ the Lord, is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Many will stumble over him who were prominent, highly thought of. And many will rise who are the despised of the earth, lepers praising God, tax collectors following Jesus, the blind, the lame, whom people would look at and say, there's a reason you're that way. Who sinned? Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? No, he will rise. He, he will raise up and people will rise as a result of their devotion to him. And for a sign that is opposed. Because the more wonders he works, the more people whose lives are transformed, the more people who will despise him. 
That's what's happening in the church in China and around the world. And then he says, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. It's parenthetic. By the way, Mary, this precious baby that you're going to nurture and raise, his end will come in such a way that you will be devastated. Parenthetically, he was not telling her that she would become co-mediatrix, a co-mediator with him, that her blood would be mingled with him, co-redemptrix, that her suffering would be suffering. None of that. He wasn't no. just saying his, his end is going to bring great grief to you. And the purpose is so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. That's, that's what the gospel does, doesn't it, folks? Your, your heart, my heart's laid out before the Lord and, and before others. People that along the way seem so sweet and become so mean. People that seem to have little to offer and yet flourish and, and make great impact. Evangelists in their environment. Things are revealed. The gospel reveals. Not only a revelation of the glory of God, the gospel reveals it. The word cuts to the dividing of joint and marrow, soul, soul and spirit. It opens it up. Oh, dear God, I pray that what will be revealed in us this year, 2018's gone. We can't get it back. 2019 is before us. May our thoughts and hearts be revealed and and what is revealed shown that we are, we are lovers of God. We are followers of Christ. Nothing gets in the way of that. We're not convenient Christians. We're committed Christians. We can learn from these voices of the incarnation if we will. And then we should commit to add our voices to theirs because the word the world still needs to hear a savior has been born all the nativities are going to be put back in boxes in a few days the trees coming down the trimmings packed up the gift wrap thrown away but the world still needs to hear there has been born to us a savior who will save his people from their sins. His name is Jesus. He is king, not only of the Jews, but of all the earth. He is Christ. He doesn't want to be Christ. Wouldn't like to be Christ. Doesn't hope to be Christ. He is Christ the Lord. And that's why Philippians 2 says that at every, every knee, oh, brothers and sisters, it's not will we bow. It's when will you bow? The hardest heart you know. It's not a question of will he or she bow. It's when. Will we bow while we live to the Lordship of Christ? Or will we bow at the judgment to our utter condemnation? Herod teaches us it's not enough to talk about worship. Joseph teaches us we need to be doers of the word. The Magi's teach us that, that there is no inconvenience so great that should hinder us from our pursuit to discover him who's born king of the Jews. Simeon teaches us we, we should be found in the right place. I thought, what if he had not attended temple that day? What if he said, ah, I'm tired. I've been doing this for years, looking for the Messiah. and coming. I'm going to take a day off. I deserve a break. He would have missed holding the Lord's cross. Oh, brothers and sisters, the voices from the incarnation shout to us in this generation. In the West, where our temptation is to take our ease in Zion, they shout, tell the good news, embrace the good news, bow to the babe of Bethlehem, who's King of kings and Lord of lords. Live your life for him. Because when it's all been said and done, that's what matters.
that I live my life for him. Is that you? Is that your heart's desire for your, for your family? I have family members who are not doing that. My heart breaks every day. Every day. Until I see Christ formed in them. I'm a pastor. My heart breaks every day for members. Until I see Christ being formed in them. Let's not let this season of the incarnation pass us by without coming face to face with its realities and its implications. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you in Jesus' name and, oh, oh, in the face of such commitment, such determination, we repent Pray that you'll let us live long enough to see the dawn of 2019 that we can bring fruit of repentance, of complacency, bad habits developed, distractions. Lord, I confess to being distracted. Oh, I want my gaze, my focus fixed. Upon Jesus, I, I want to. I want to turn my eyes upon Jesus so intentionally, intensely that, and looking full into the face of who He is and what He came to do, that that the world will take its right perspective. That there will be things in the world that are very bright right now that will grow strangely dim because of the gospel light and gospel glory that comes from Him. We ask this in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen.